Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Martin Andrews. I'm from Inquire Ed, and welcome to today's webinar using primary sources from the Library of Congress. We have lots of participants joining today. Let's take a brief tour of your Zoom dashboard. This was something that I think was more necessary a few weeks ago when uh, most of the population was unfamiliar with Zoom, but my guess is, is that you're coming to know it a little bit better now. And uh, if you see at the bottom, there's a Q&A feature. That is how you're going to communicate uh, several times when we ask you some questions. Um, we'll also do a couple polls today. So we don't have um, a chat feature enabled. We can chat to you. And uh, that will be how we communicate to you in some cases. So everyone is joining right now. So welcome as people still are coming in. I want to let you know that we're going to share resources with you today, but you don't have to frantically take screenshots or copy and paste them. We are going to send you all of the things that we talk about, the links, in a blog post. What will happen is tomorrow you'll get an email. There'll be a link to that blog post. And in there will be the resources that we talked about during this webinar, in addition to a recording of the webinar that you can rewatch or share. So just know that that is coming your way. And um, please share it with whomever you choose. Today's webinar is co-hosted by uh, some really great organizations. Our first one uh, we're going to talk about is NCSS, the National Council for the Social Studies. Founded in 1921, the National Council for the Social Studies is the largest professional association in the country devoted solely to social studies education. NCSS engages and supports educators in strengthening and advocating for the social studies. Go to socialstudies.org to find out more. We're also co-hosted by Inquire Ed today. Inquire Ed believes that inquiry-based learning should be available to every classroom. We create inquiry-based learning social studies curriculum that helps students develop critical thinking skills, make informed decisions, and take positive action to influence their world. We also create professional learning tools and resources that help teachers and instructional leaders implement inquiry in their schools and districts. It is also hosted by the Right Question Institute. The Right Question Institute is a nonprofit educational organization offering a simple, powerful strategy, the question formulation technique that builds people's skills to ask better questions, participate in decisions that affect them, advocate for themselves, and partner with service providers. RQI's innovative methods are delivered through educational institutions and organizations, healthcare organizations, social service organizations, community-based organizations, and public agencies all over the country and beyond. And finally, uh, the Library of Congress Teaching with Primary Sources Consortium. The Library of Congress awards grants to a diverse array of educational organizations, including universities, historical societies, foundations, for-profit companies, and school districts that assist in the design and the delivery of the Teaching with Primary Sources program. These grantees who comprise the TPS Consortium deliver TPS professional development and academic courses, design curriculum and apps online, um, that use primary sources from the library's collection. So we're so thankful to be joined uh, by representatives of each of these organizations. Um, first, uh, from NCSS, we have Dr. Tina Hefner. She is the president of the National Council for the Social Studies and is a professor at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, where she directs the PhD in curriculum and instruction and the MED in secondary education. Tina's publications include seven co-authored books and five edited books, including titles such as Beginning Inquiry, Short Text for Inexperienced Readers in U.S. History, Seeds of Inquiry, Using Short Text to Enhance Students' Understanding of World History. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tina. Thank you, Martin. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be with such esteemed colleagues uh, from two other organizations. Uh, it's really an honor to be among such a great panel. Great, and another one of our uh, 
panelists today is Sarah Westbrook. She is the Director of Professional Learning at the Right Question Institute. As a high school English teacher in Boston, Sarah developed a deep appreciation for the innovative work educators do every day that often goes unseen and unrecognized. She now partners with schools and districts around the country to design professional learning and collaborates with individual classroom teachers to highlight their work from Chicago Public Schools, Cincinnati Public Schools, all over the country. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Thank you so much and welcome to everyone. It's really exciting to see um, new, new faces and lots of old friends in the chat box. And we're really excited to be here with um, Tina, Anne, and Jen. Yeah, and Anne, is, Anne Canning is a retired professor of education from Waynesburg University, where she taught secondary social studies curriculum methods and directed the Masters of Instructional Technology program. Currently, she is a facilitator and curriculum developer of online PD courses for the Library of Congress, TPS Eastern Region Consortium. She teaches ongoing asynchronous classes, TPS basics for classroom teachers and li librarians. Anne, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I must echo Tina that I am uh, both honored and uh, excited to be here. Great. And finally, Jennifer Hansen is the Director of Library Surface Services at Wooster Academy and has over a decade of experience teaching information and technology literacy skills. She previously worked for the nonprofit organization Primary Source, which focuses on bringing diverse and multicultural perspectives into school curriculum. Jennifer has been an educational consultant for the Library of Congress, teaching with Primary Sources Eastern Region partner at Waynesburg University since 2011. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. Thanks, Martin. Great, so um, now the question is, who is out there for you? And we're gonna try something here. I'm just gonna launch uh, a poll and it asks you to tell us what your um, what your role is in education. Uh, elementary teacher, middle school teacher, people are filling it up right now. I can see it all populating and we'll see where, where it falls, how many high school teachers, elementary teachers, administrators. I put parent educator on there, which I feel like all of us are if we have kids now, um, <laughs> especially now. Great. Thank you so much for filling that out. Looks like we've, we've got about 25% high school teachers, 27% middle school teachers, 12% elementary teachers. We've got some administrators and curriculum directors, some instructional coaches out there, some post-secondary people, parent education, and others from different organizations as well. Whoever you are, I hope that you are going to be able to get something out of today's webinar. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to tell you, one of the things that we're going to try to do is present you with uh, a source, a task, and a tool. And we're going to keep it simple because I think that we can all acknowledge, and I need to acknowledge as we begin this, that we are all overwhelmed. It's like someone showed up on our door a few weeks ago and said, you're leaving for a trip. You've got to pack in an hour. And when we asked where we were going, they said it could be south of the equator. It could be Antarctica. It could be in the mountains. And when we asked how long we would be there, they said one week or two or five or six. And then they said, you should pack all of these things. We have free things for you to pack. So we are just overwhelmed with resources and tasks. We're in a, we're in a new situation and we're feeling overwhelmed, but you are here today because we are all also learning. So you have made it here today. You are trying to move from uh, crisis education uh, to uh, distance learning. And when we're putting it all together and we're trying to figure out, it can feel like we're just trying to plug the leaks, but you're here today uh, to learn and hopefully we'll, we'll present you with some simple things that you can try in your, in your virtual classrooms next week. And we are going to start uh, this with the um, Teaching with Primary Sources uh, presentation. So now I have the joy of turning over 
control of this whole thing to Anne. So Anne, can you tell us a little bit about Teaching with Primary Sources? And then I think Jen is going to um, do our activity for today. That's correct. Jen and I have been uh, working with together with the TPS uh, Eastern Region. And I wanted you to see this map because there are three TPS regions, uh, in the East, the West, and the Midwest. And uh, all of us are working very hard to uh, provide sources that you can use in your classroom. Next slide, Martin. Uh, <clears throat> During this period of distance learning and stay at home orders, there are many TPS initiatives that will help you and your students connect to each other and to grow. Today, you're going to hear from two of our newest TPS consortium members, the RQI and the NCSS, but let me describe two of my, my other favorites. Uh, first on the left is a list of TPS Civics Interactive Student Apps. And as Martin promised, there's going to be um, a blog with links to all of these. And the wonderful thing that you're going to find exciting about these is they start with kindergarten and they go to 12th grade. So uh, the, these are interactive apps that your students can use and you can, can blend them into your classroom. Now, Martin said we were going to keep this simple, but I still have the whole screen. I can't see what my slide is saying. Um, the other one I wanted to share with you is the TPS Teachers Network. This is a virtual space, and it's for educators of all descriptions and from all places to share and learn about using primary sources in their classroom. The members of the TPS Teachers Network come from all across our country, uh, but it was organized and is actually maintained by the TPS uh, Western Region. So, um, next slide, Martin. I wanted to point out the Library of Congress's primary source analysis tool. This is our go-to, our startup um, analysis tool. Many of you have seen it before. But I put it here today <clears throat> because I really wanted you to see that it, it, there's more than just what meets the eye. At first glance, this looks uh, like the graphic organizer. Um, <clears throat> but today we're going to point out that this can be uh, repurposed. It can, it's very flexible. It's very practical. And uh, there are lots of different ways to use it. For example, if you look at the circle icon on the top right corner, the observe, reflect, question, inquiry cycle that uh, we love to use, if you were to click on that, it would spin to the right. And if you click twice, it would spin to the left, simply to point out to teachers and students that there's, there's no, no place to start. You can start where you would like to start and you can go back and forth between the columns and you really can, can move around. There is no particular order that you have to go in. There also is no, um, no one correct answer. We're looking for lots of different answers with this. So that's, that's our analysis tool. And uh, now I would like to uh, move to the next slide and turn it over to Jen. Jen, take it away. Show us how we can turn this analysis tool into a Google form. Thanks, Anne. Um, we're going to be looking at a Google form that we've created. Uh, you've probably seen an activity like this called Four Corners or Zoom In. We've taken an image from the Library of Congress and broken it into four different pieces. Um, so let me share my screen. And when I share my screen, Anne is also going to put the link uh, in the chat box to this activity. So you can go there. Um, please go there because this is interactive. Um, the first screen you'll see is just going to give you a short description. If you just click the next button, it will take you to our first image. If you were doing this uh, in, in an online learning environment or in a classroom, um, you would not walk students through it the way that I'm going to walk you through it. <laughs> but 
Um, otherwise, we'll have a lot of dead air and a lot of silence um, if, if I don't do a little bit of talking as we look at this. But we've taken the I've so broken it down by um, break into pieces. So our first um, observation, um, we just ask, what do you see? And you can type your answer there in the box. I'll give you a few seconds, um, about 10 or 15 seconds to do that. And then after you um, enter you know, what you see, your observations, there's a lot in this image. Um, that you could comment on. Um, then we'll click the next button. So if you click next with me, um, then you have another piece of the image. And you can again make an observation of what do you see in this image. And you can stay on one of these observation pages. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go on to the reflection. Um, we've added more of the image. There's a lot going on in this image. Um, you have different children. And what we're asking here in the reflection piece is, what do you see that you didn't see before? Um, what do you think this might be representing with the three images you've already seen? Um, and then what evidence is supporting your claim? Uh, anytime we do the inquiry process, um, especially with students, we really want them to draw on that evidence piece. Um, what evidence are you seeing in an image? Why are you making the, the claim that you're making? Um, really have them focus on that piece. So our third image here, um, and if you're not here yet, that's okay. I'm going to give you a little bit of time at the end. And then our last image brings it all together. Um, and so now we can see the whole image and we're gonna ask what questions do you still have? Um, once you see the full image, I, your students, you or your students will have a lot of questions. This might be a very familiar image for most of you. Um, if you've studied um, imperialism, um, especially United States imperialism, um, this is going to be a very familiar image. Um, our high school teachers, even um, middle school American studies, this might be an image that you've used with your students. Um, so I'm gonna give you a few minutes. Um, maybe we'll just take about 45 seconds. Um, if you're answering these questions along the way, you can go ahead and answer the questions. I'm going to switch over to the back end of my Google form and I can see um, your responses as they come in. So you keep responding to the questions and we're going to look at the responses here now as they're coming in. So those of you who have used Google forms before, um, this, you may have used it uh, to take a poll or do a survey, um, but as you can see, there are ways that you can embed images into a Google form and have students respond to those images. Um, you can see, uh, so we have 23 responses so far. Um, so I can see what you're responding, what your responses are. Um, again, if we're doing this in an online learning environment, um, you could give the students the link in the chat box, give them a few minutes, maybe seven to 10 minutes to really dig in and, and respond to this. Um, but you can watch their responses as they come in. Um, this is a great way to take a quick assessment, see how students are doing and see what you might need to address or what they're understanding well. Um, you could also give this as a homework assignment. Um, so this could be something you could give them this Google form, they could fill it out in their own time. So it doesn't have to be a timed uh, activity or response. Um, and then you can see, you know, again, the next time the class meets, if you're doing a live activity um, or if you're just doing asynchronous um, teaching right now, um, this is a great way to engage students um, in a primary source-based inquiry activity. 
let's see what questions you had about this. Okay, um, so some of your questions, what do the children represent? Um, what does the book say? What's on the blackboard? Um, when was this done? And I'll give you that information in just a moment. Um, why does Uncle Sam have glasses? Um, who are the children being excluded? Um, who was the audience? Where was this published? Um, you can also create an Excel spreadsheet from this. Um, so this is what the Excel spreadsheet looks like. It's the same information. Yeah, and um, if, uh, let me hop in. If people wanted to make sure that they navigated back to Zoom now so that they can see your screen sharing. Oh, yes. Good idea. Yeah. Um, so you can also get all of the information into the spreadsheet. Um, same information. What's nice about the spreadsheet is that it will connect the name. Um, so we voluntarily asked for your name. You could make that required for the students because obviously you would want to know um, who was giving me what response. Um, so that if there was something that you needed to address with another student, you could do that. Um, I think we're going to do Q&A at the end, right, Martin? Yeah, um, some of the questions are, can you see which, so th there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your um, Zoom. So if you wanted to ask some questions that, uh, that Jen could answer really quickly, like, can you see which student provided an answer in the Google form? You can if you require their login, right? Yes, um, yes. you can ask for either at the beginning before um, you jump into the activity, or at the end, you could ask for their student name and they would have to provide that. Um, you could just make it a required piece of the form and then um, you'd know which, which response goes with which student. Yeah. Um, this is also great because you can save this data. Um, as I said, um, you can kind of see where students are, are getting hung up. Um, I did say I would tell you, um, when, where this comes from and when it was created. Um, the title of this, and I'm just waiting for, there we go. Oops. Oops. Some of the questions, how, how much can you zoom in on the source? Can you, can you do any zooming on the um, Google form at all? So on the Google form itself, you can't zoom in. So um, the detail would come in how you crop it. Um, yeah. So I cropped the images really closely. Um, so if we go back to, for example, the first or second image, um, we decided what pieces we wanted to focus on and that was based on how I cropped it. I, it could have a totally different crop instead of focusing on Uncle Sam here at the beginning, we could have zoomed in on some of the children instead, um, or we could zoom in on the door um, and the two children that are at the door. Um, so it's totally up to you how you crop the image. Um, you definitely, when you're doing a four corners activity or a zoom in activity like this, you want to make sure you have an image that has enough detail um, that there is information to analyze, right? Um, I mean, we know that as, as good yeah. teachers. Um, but how you, the images that you put in here, totally up to you. Um, the question of can you zoom in, the only way that you could zoom in a little bit more would be to use the browser um, zoom. So you could hit, if you're on a Mac, for example, it's like command plus. So you could make your screen a little bit bigger and zoom in a little bit more. Or actually, Jen, you could give them the link to this original document if you wanted, for example, them to read those words on the blackboard that Richard Hughes was asking about. Um, at one point, I would send students to the original, the Library Congress, I think. Yes. Um, and so this is from 1899 uh, and it's called School, Be School Begins. Um, so another really nice piece of this, because it's from 1899, it's also in the public domain. Um, so we can use this um, in activities like this. Um, you don't have to worry about any copyright issues um, if you're using this, this image. Um, you could give the, the link to the Library of Congress um, image, um, which will be provided to you in a follow-up email. Um, and then on the Library of Congress website, they also have great features of being able to zoom in um, and look at more detail um, on an image. 
And I think one of the great things about Google Form, the functionality there is that uh, you could you could show images, but the idea that students can comment in there and then that can populate a spreadsheet so that you can see what those answers are. That's the real, I think a really great uh, part of that and how you examine the image uh, could, could be separate a little bit from the Google Form too. So if people want to zoom in on that. Let me go back um, to the um, uh, presenting here. Yeah, let me do that. So I was just looking at the questions in the Q&A. Um, are you able to do an activity like this in um, Office 365? You could do something um, in like a PowerPoint like this. Um, so you wouldn't be able to get the real-time feedback from a PowerPoint, but you could definitely break break an image up and put it onto PowerPoint slides. Um, for adapting it from an online activity to uh, paper, again, you could cut up an image. Um, I know that might take a lot of work, but you could cut something up and put it, you know, maybe in a particular order for students to look at, um, and then they could write their responses um, on, on the image and maybe send you, if they've got access to, um, you know, a phone, they could send you a picture um, and send you pictures of, of their comments on, on the cut up in, images. Are, is everyone seeing um, uh, the notes page again, panelists? Yeah, great. Um, so if you wanna talk a little bit about uh, this then, Jen, and then we'll move on to, um, to RQI and the question formulation technique. Sure. Um, so something else, you'll be getting an article that goes along with how to do this activity, um, how to create your own Google form. Um, it comes from the TPS partner, um, the Barat Education Foundation. So um, they, were the, they were the ones that um, initially did an inquiry activity with Google Forms, and then we just took it and adapted it um, for our own needs. Um, you can pick the image that you want. You could do it with a um, modern day photograph, a contemporary photograph, you could do it with a primary source um, with something more historical. Um, it's totally up to you, um, but just to give you that, um, that strategy of using a Google form, especially um, now that we're in this um, day of online learning, um, it's a great way to get pretty quick feedback from your students. Um, if you want this particular uh, image, um, the school begins, you can email me or Ann, and I believe our email addresses will be provided to you. Um, and we can share our Google form with you and you can just make a copy of it and use it with your students. And I'm gonna collect some of these questions so that we can um, go back to them at the end. So just so you know. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah. Uh, Sarah Westbrook is going to take us through the QFT and show us um, a different tool that we could also use to create this inquiry-based learning online. Sarah? Great, thank you so much. Um, and, and that was fun, Jen and Ann, thanks. So this is a little bit of an experiment, so we'll see how we do. Um, a lot of you may already know the question formulation technique, um, and so I'm, I'm really going to go through it really quickly. And we have today and happen to have been peeping at who are who's joined the webinar and I know a lot of you out there are QFT experts so I'm going to focus on the virtual application um, the question formulation technique was created by the right question Institute which is where I work we're based in Boston and um, you might know us from this green book make just one change next slide so in a nutshell, the question formulation technique is a step-by-step -step protocol. Individuals produce questions, improve and strategize on questions, and then reflect on what they learned. Next slide. And, and it is a, a very simple process, I think a deceptively simple process. It does fit all on one page or one slide, which we're very proud of. We like to say that um, one of our favorite reviews of the book, Make Just One Change, is a negative review that says, oh, you, you didn't need a whole book to do this. You could have just done it in two pages. And we're very proud of the fact that we can, in fact, do it in one. Um, and it does translate quite well virtually. So I, I happen to know a couple of you who are in this webinar have already done it virtually. This is just one idea I had 
about how to do it. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna ask everybody, and I'll put, um, I'm gonna put the link in the chat box now. So this is the Padlet we're gonna use. And so you're gonna move into another screen and you'll still hear me talking and I'm going to share my screen. But um, it's really, I think it's better if you can pull up that Padlet now and be looking at that because um, like we like to say at the Right Question Institute, we're gonna put you to work. Um, so let me see, Martin, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. First. Okay. Okay. Okay, are you seeing it? Yes. Excellent. So I've done step one. Okay, so um, so Padlet is a really great tool. A lot of teachers have access to it. It's free to create an account. And then I think there is a, you know, you can get a more advanced account um, if you, after a paywall, but the basic account is free. And um, I've created a template here that you're very free to take and replicate, and I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Um, so just for the sake of ease here, I'm going to change the color of the step that we're on, and we're going to move very quickly. So if you're just not sure what step of the process we're on, you're going to see the yellow color change. And then when we're done with that step, I'm going to change it back. Um, and I've made a couple modifications here, so you'll see that I've adapted the process quite a bit. If you're, if you're curious about the full process or you're not familiar with the question formulation technique, um, that's totally fine. You can head over to writequestion.org and there are some great introductory resources there. And I've also put some notes in the comments section. If you look at the little comment box on each note, that has some of my um, quote unquote show notes where I'm putting in different ways that I'm modifying the process. Okay, so let's start, let's start on step one. Normally I'd ask you to have a whole discussion about the, the rules for producing questions and what might be challenging about following them. For now, just think about that on your own. And I'll remind you that we're about to ask questions on a primary source you are following these four rules. So you're asking as many questions as you can. You're not discussing or judging or answering. You're writing down every question exactly as it comes to mind and you're changing any statements into question. So we're gonna move on then to the question focus, which in this case is a primary source. Um, and that's what we're gonna be asking questions about. So I'd ask everybody just for 30 seconds, you can click to enlarge that, that primary source image um, and just take about 30 seconds to really observe it as closely as you can. Think about what questions you might have. And so it, we're about to have 30 seconds of dead air time and then I'll call you back. But for now, you're just observing the image. And if you have a chance, you may want to read the citation I provided for the image as well. Okay. All right. So that was 30 seconds. It was a quick 30 seconds. Um, but we're, we're now going to start asking questions. So just a reminder, you're, you're going to ask questions about that image. You can also ask about the citation notes if you'd like to also. I see them going together as a prompt. Okay. All right. So now we are a really large group today. So as a lot of you know, um, the question formulation technique is about getting as many questions as you can and thinking really divergently. 
So, but we're, we're very large today. So what I'd ask just for the sake of um, sort of clarity here is if every person could only post a couple questions, at least initially, um, just to make sure that everybody has a chance and there's room for everyone. So you'll see that I'm asking you to post questions in a particular format. Um, I'm asking you to put the question in bold and then if you can put your initials down in the, um, the write something section. So it looks like some of you are already doing it. Thank you, that's awesome. So go ahead and write any questions you had um, and feel free to move. You can go all the way over to the right hand side. You can um, scroll all the way down on the page. You just wanna avoid going below, um, below that blue dotted line. So go ahead and enter your questions now. And then just a reminder, if you could please um, put your initials, your first and last initials. And if you've already posted a question, you can always edit your question with the little, um, the, there's a little tool. And then you can move your questions around too. So if, so, if someone covers yours up accidentally, just go ahead and move it um, so that it makes a little bit more sense. Oops. So we're gonna ask questions for about one, one more minute. And if you haven't had a chance, go ahead, type your question in. Um, if you've already asked a couple questions, go ahead and read what other people wrote. So read what others are writing and see if that, that's something that sparks another question for you. If it does, you could go ahead and um, put a comment on their question. There's a little chat box in the lower right hand corner that you can always you can comment on someone else's question and go ahead everybody you it, your screen should um scroll a little bit so if a few of you want to move your questions over to the side that would be helpful i'm going to start moving a little bit i apologize if i move your question somewhere weird I don't think normally our, we would have 200 people in our in our class. Maybe we would. Uh, I, but. You know, I, <laughs> somewhere out there, there is someone who has 200 people that's, in the class, yeah, and I really feel for you. <laughs> so that's right. Usually, you know, usually you have maybe you have 20, 25, 30 kids, and so there's plenty of room. But you, but you can always, it keeps expanding with you, so that's kind of nice about the tool. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna pause this there. If you're still typing your question, go ahead and finish, that's totally fine. All right, and um, we're gonna move us on to the next step. Now, I, so let, let me turn this blue again. Okay, and then if you haven't read what other people asked, I really encourage you to do that. There are some really interesting questions down here, although I'm not supposed to judge questions as the facilitator of this exercise. Um, so I'm moving us on to step four, which is called improve your questions. And um, this is, again, this is a modified version of this step just for the sake of brevity. Um, so I'd like you to take a look at your questions now and see if you can label, label one of your questions, um, decide whether it's closed or open-ended. So um, a closed-ended question is any question that can be answered with a yes, no, or one word. And open-ended is anything that requires more explanation. So I'm asking you, just go down, find one of your questions, and right next to where you dropped in your initials, just um, label it C or O. And I'll give you 30 seconds to accomplish that. So you're finding a question, you're going to label it C or O. I kind of like, you know, it is a little bit messy up here, but I kind of like that. I, I think um, that's reflective of some of the some of the curiosity and the divergent thinking that um, happens when you when you enter the QFT process. 
So I see a lot of questions are labeled C or O. Thank you. So let's move on to the next step. I know, again, I know this is short, but there are some more materials on writequestion.org that go um, more um, step by step. So we're moving on to step five. So step five is prioritizing questions. We're going to be using those little heart boxes. Um, and so I'm asking you to think about the three questions you feel most curious about. And when you find a question that you feel most curious about, whether it's your question or someone else's question, just go ahead and click that little like button. Um, that will be familiar to those of us who spend a lot of time on social media. So you can, it could be your question, someone else's question. Um, go ahead and, and try to see if you can find three questions that you would, you would vote for. And again, feel free to move all over the screen. I'll try to sort out some of these questions here, move them around so we can see them. Let's take a few more seconds. Keep voting on those questions, the ones that you're most curious about. Okay. So this can be kind of an interesting way to choose priority questions. I mean, if you, um, for an entire class of kids, it can be difficult to come to consensus. And so voting like this might be kind of a fun way to do it. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna move us on just for the sake of time. Um, now we normally, our, the last step of the process is a reflection. I'm going to actually pause on that because I think we'll have a chance as a whole group right at the end of the webinar to sort of think about what we've learned today and reflect on that learning. So um, I'm actually going to ask you to take a look at step six now, which is about further investigation. And um, if you think about going about answering your priority questions, what would, how would you do that? <laughs> what, what are some possible next steps that you personally would take? So whatever question for you, you felt was a priority, how would you go about answering that? And what are some, some possible next steps? And I asked you just for the sake of clarity, instead of posting a new, um, you know, stick it, sticky note post-it, could you comment on the questions themselves? So go to one of your priority questions, comment on the question itself. What, how could you go about investigating that question or what would some of your next steps be? So while, while people are entering some ideas for next steps, I'm just gonna show you a couple things um, while I still have the screen share power. So if you could enter a thought about a next step and you would enter that as a comment, just drop that last comment in and start migrating back to Zoom so you can see my screen again. All right, so hopefully you see my screen. Um, there, Zoom, um, and are looking at the Zoom window. So Padlet is, Padlet is a great tool. If this is a template that you like and are interested in, you can always come up here to the top and click the remake button and that'll prompt you to create um, a Padlet account or to log into your Padlet account if you already have one. And then you can play around with things and move them and change the background. Um, and edit it as it is most useful to you and your students. And I think that's a really fun thing for students to do. And you can do it like we are live um, on Zoom, or you could also assign one piece each day and students could log in each day and enter questions and then the next day come back and work on open and closed questions. And then the next day work on prioritizing. 
So I think there's a lot of flexibility here. And um, Martin, I will give the power back to you. <laughs> okay, let me figure out how I take the power back. Oh, um, oh great. actually, yeah. no, I stopped. I stopped to share, so okay. she'll be back to you now. Great. Um, let me get back to our presentation. Um, oh, I should say also that I, I, I shamelessly stole this Padlet activity from Anne. So um, really, I, I am indebted to Anne. And we both give you all permission to go ahead and remake our, um, our Padlet. Th this is just a couple ideas. Again, you, you can't click on these links. But if you um, receive the email at the end, you will get these links. This is just an idea I had about if students had asked questions on that I am an American sign, here are some places on the library that you could um, go and do some additional research. And um, there's a great Dorothea Lang co collection. And again, this is thanks to Anne for pulling some of these resources. Next slide. Um, there are more free resources at writequestion.org. Next slide. And all of our resources are, are free and available um, for you to use as long as you're sourcing the Right Question Institute. Next slide. Thank you. And a yeah. little primary source um, humor. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Sarah. And we had some questions about, about this. And I think we'll, we'll make sure we get them at the end because we want to move on um, to Tina. And Tina is going to share with us as well. Um, so Tina, you just tell me when to go forward, and okay. um, and we will uh, we'll we'll move. So the National Council for the Social Studies, as part of our work with a consortium with the Library of Congress, is we're working to develop methods textbooks uh, for elementary, middle, and high school teachers. We'll have two online textbooks that will be accessible. Uh, freely to anyone, they'll be open access. And what we do with methods textbooks is they're designed specifically for teaching pre-service teachers how to engage and work with primary sources. So I'm taking that particular uh, context and, and sharing some information. So this is an activity that we, the authors uh, that are contributing to the, the primary source text, uh, this is something that we've engaged in together and that we field tested with our uh, students too. So let's start first uh, with this particular image. And I want you to either, if I had an interactive whiteboard, what I'd ask you to do is circle evidence that you see, what do you notice that's right there in the image. But what I'll have you do instead is if you'll just, uh, in the question answer, make some observations of what you, you notice, what do you see? And with the second stage we're asking is confirm what evidence might support that. So for instance, if I were thinking about this myself, one way I might start is I might say, well, I see, uh, it looks like I see um, wind or it seems like cold wind because I see the branches of the trees that are bare. So that might be my evidence that I might do that. And then my inferences or the ways in which I interpret it would be the questions. But let's start first with just what are you noticing? And then I'd like for you to just jump quickly to the questions. Write a question that you have about this particular image. And I'll pause briefly while you do that. So I see question of, is this an ink image or maybe print? I see women in a crowd with a woman in front holding a, a woman suffrage flag, women marching in a parade. I notice the leading woman seems to be middle-aged or older and serious. I'm asking questions such as, when was the image captured? Now, and, Notice the questions that you're asking. I would ask that these questions be tethered to evidence. What might make you ask that specific question? Why is one woman grabbing a shepherd's hook? And that's an interesting observation that you made. So what would make you say it's a shepherd's hook? We see a, a staff with a hook on the end. I see that, but what makes me think it's a shepherd's hook? So what we're trying to do in this particular activity is delineate between what we're seeing, what we notice, 
and what we might think, how we interpret, how to begin to think about that. And where is the information that's influencing our potential interpretation? Is it coming from evidence in the source or is it coming from other sources? Shepherd's Hook might be a religious reference that I might think of. All right, Martin, if you'll click to the next slide. So often when I'm engaging interactive spaces, uh, on, I make sure that I have examples and you can reveal these exam examples. Like I'm, I see women, but they seem to be affluent and white. What might me, make me say that? There's a brooch on the first woman's sleeve. If you were to, able, and to enlarge, and if, if you access the, the source in a library, you can enlarge it to see that. Uh, there's also, I think these are white women because they're, they're all, they seem very pale in complexion. Uh, and then these are some of the questions that in doing this and applying this with our students, these are the questions that were, were generated to give examples. The, the example on the right is the circling. When you're doing the interactive board, whiteboard, what you can do is allow your students to interact with you and draw and circle and highlight the things that they're seeing. And then they can explain why they highlighted that, or they can explain what question is tethered to that particular evidence. But again, we're trying to lift out what evidence are they paying attention to? And how does that evidence lead to specific questions? All right, Martin, let's go on to the next slide. So the, here's some general captions. If, you, if I ask you to take the evidence and, that you looked at and the information that you generated from your observations, what would you title this? What caption? And so what we're going to do is we're gonna ask you to poll. So here's some options and I want you to select which title you think best represents what you see in the specific image. And then in Zoom here, we can end the poll whenever we yes, whenever go ahead, you let's get. End, so yes. I'll, I'll end it, and then you can share okay. the results. Right. So Martin's going to share that with you. Uh, winds of change, the suffrage march from west to east, and that's interesting because I would ask you, where did that evidence come from that might suggest west to east? We didn't talk about the snow-capped mountains in the back, uh, the rock boulder that seems to be to the right. Uh, the, the evergreen trees that are tall, the landscape that goes from flat to, to mountainous. I mean, are those geographical uh, representations of what the West might look like? And why would you say this is West to East? These would be questions that we would follow up in a discussion with, and the discussion would occur in a synchronous space if we were utilizing Zoom in this manner, uh, exercising some of these interactive tools. Right, so let's, it, yes, Nearpod does allow for this too as well. Uh, Flip, uh, Flipgrid, Pear Deck are also other tools that you could use to do this too. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. So now let's consider this image. And what I want you to do is just as you did before, I want you to pay attention to what do you notice? What do you see in the image? And What's the evidence that helps you explain what you're seeing and what questions might you have? So if you will, in the question answer box, uh, make some observations of what you see and ask some questions. Oops. Well, I think you get the idea of what you're doing, but I wanna see dismay. Uh, where are they going? Why is the lead woman hunching over? Rocks and trees seem similar to what we saw in the previous image, nice observation. I notice a group of what I assume to be Native Americans. And one reason, evidence, baby on board, all right? That's a good way to draw, draw from evidence. 
they're clearly struggling. That's interesting. Is that Shaman leading the way? Where, and they're outside. Where are the Native Americans going? All right, let's skip to the, uh, the next slide. So here are some observations of things that would have been said by students in my class. Uh, similar questions. Interesting note, generations of women is an observation. Why do they have generations? Because it seems like each of the women are at different ages and there seem to be five generations here. Why are there five generations of women pictured together? What is the artist's purpose? So these are some questions that you would get from this uh, particular image. Now I want you to go to the next slide, please. All right, for this, similar to that we did with the last image, what I want you to do, and we'll poll again, I want you to identify based on the evidence that you observed and the questions that you asked, what is the title or caption that you think most represents this particular image? All right, so why don't we end the poll? No, you may not have had a chance to cast. Uh, on the lookout, that's an interesting choice with generations right behind that. I was curious if you would end up selecting generations first because one thing that I am doing with you uh, and I do with my pre-service teachers but I do not do with students is I withhold my opinion and my comments because most of the time uh, students will provide affirmation bias and they'll articulate back what I'm saying. All right, so if you'll continue on to the next slide, Martin, thank you. So how are these images related? So if I juxtapose these two images, how are they related? And one strategy that I might use to do this, and if you'll click on the next slide, is I can do a noticing and wondering activity where I take the information that I gathered and I noticed from image one, and I can write my questions about that. The image two and write my question. And then I try to decipher how might these images be related? If you'll click on the next slide. Another thing that we can do, which is what we did in our polls, and we could report out our polls and make comparisons graphically for this, we would be able to compare titles of our, our captions. So, if the, so how is it that we're referring to image one and how is it that we're referring to image two? Because we're wanting it, the purpose behind this and what we do when we work with pre-service teachers and when, we, and when we're thinking about practice is there are many instructional moves that teachers make. And we have to understand why are we making these instructional moves? Because every move we make has a purpose. It has an intended outcome. So let's go to the next slide. So what if I introduced different and in contrast to your responses, your captions, or the captions that I gave you that have been solicited from student responses before, and this is the caption that I presented to you. What questions do you have? Write those questions in the question answer box. So the one question that was posed earlier is how are these titles created? The previous titles were titles that were given in activities with students. And these were high school students. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. So how does what we look at change how we think, what we think, and the questions we ask. So there's a caption that's missing from this particular image. And this is the caption that's presented on the right. And there was a question earlier of how could I do this at home? And if you were doing this at home, you would have one sheet here and a second sheet here, and you would ask the students to look at them. And in this case, I include the caption with it. Um, we the women of the Iroquois. And the caption that's provided here is the title of Savagery to Civilization, Indian Women, We Whom You Pity as Drudges Reached Centuries Ago, the goal that you are now nearing. So if you can click on the next slide. So there are variations of how you might present this information. One is a variation to include not just the single caption, 
that was provided in the image, but including the statement about uh, Indian women or Iroquois women. And then you could also provide, instead of the single image of women, that you could provide the image on the, the right that includes the statement that shows the empowerment, uh, particularly of Native American women. If you'll click on the next slide. So here's the actual uh, primary source um, that's from savagery to civilization. And if in this particular uh, source, if you'll click on it, questions that might arise when we're looking at the source holistically is, what questions would we have now? Why are these women presented together? That's fine, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Some questions that might surface in our discussion is, who is the, who created this? Where was it published? And it was published in Puck Magazine in May 16, 1914. Did Puck Mag Magazine publish other pictures of women's suffrage? Why would uh, Joseph Kepler have included in a satirical image uh, these two groups of women together? What message was he trying to send? Here we're moving into more disciplinary specific practices, but we're using this process of asking questions over time to help us begin to think about how is it we think differently when we're presented with different information. It was, uh, and the example of using the different parts of the image was a zoom out, and the zoom out from pieces and bits and parts because we tend to make generalizations about women, of suffrage movements, that aren't necessarily accurate. And we also tend to miss information about groups that were not represented, or we make the assumption that all women had the, did not have the right to vote, they did not have suffrage or did not exercise the right of subject suffrage in their communities. So where would we go to next? And if you'll click on the next slide. So we always ask where to next, and that's the essence of inquiry. In the National Council for the Social Studies, we have published the College Career and Civic Life Framework for inquiry. Inquiry begins with questions, and questions, compelling questions, lead us to seek information and in sources, and to utilize those sources and the evidence of those sources and look across sources to help us to develop a deeper understanding. All right, so where would these questions lead us? These are various different links that Martin will share out with you of different source sets. One is the idea book for educators on women's suffrage that you could tap into, and also looking more about Iroquois Indians and women and the rights that they exercise. This was a suffrage movement of west to east. Perhaps there were aspects of Native American autonomy that women exercised that white that women in America wanted to uh, capitalize and upon for themselves. So if you'll move on to the next slide, um, and you might ask questions more about uh, the artist himself and their links to those resources where you can, in Puck Magazine too, of other examples. Uh, and identifying this question of why was it a West to East movement? then the west to east would have been, you can begin with some maps and news map analysis that might lead you to those questions. One aspect of when we talk about instructional moves as educators with working with primary sources is that we never use sources in isolation. We always use sources in collections because sources produce a singular identity on a topic, a singular perspective and opinion. And so therefore we want to make sure that we show a more diverse representation of this. So if you'll click on the, the last slide, I think we're ready for some uh, general questions. Yeah, th Tina, thank you so much. Um, and uh, yes, you will get a copy of the slides uh, and the, or the sources where you can find those is one of our questions. So I wanted to um, thank our panelists, Jen and Tina and Ann and Sarah. And I want to leave a few minutes for, for questions that have already been asked. Um, and then you can also use the Q&A function to ask some more questions. Um, and one of the questions that was asked, and I think you referenced it a little bit, Tina, um, was a question that I think all of us are asking ourselves is that all, we're always assuming that um, students have internet access and that's not the case. Um, and so for students, when you are printing these activities out, um, is there a way that they can be printed and that students can engage with them? And, and anyone who wants to answer that can, can answer it uh, based on their own activity. 
Well, and I would say that when I first did this activity, I did it as a static copy. I did not necessarily do it as a digitally interactive session. So, you know, the ways in which you utilize materials and sources in the classroom can be replicated in your packets. And I, I will mention a tool that I specifically use is Snagit, so I can capture pieces of the images uh, and, and present those in separate parts. So if you present them on different pieces of paper or front and back, you ask them to look at one first, then look at the second, and you give them a step-by-step -step instructions, you can still replicate this process in a, um, a more traditional form. Great, and, and we have some questions just generally, what do these activities look like on an iPhone or an Android? You would have to, when you design them, because you do have students that are accessing it um, via those devices, that preview what it looks like on, um, on an iPhone. Um, sometimes certain, like a Google Form works well on an iPhone. Um, but what would the image look like? Uh, those are those are real questions that you would have to ask yourself um, and explore. I don't think there's one uh, answer to that. Um, Tina, when will the textbook be available? So we are working on our first draft copy that uh, we will be vetting uh, within the academic community because we're developing this as a, um, a peer reviewed process. So we will have members of the higher education community and we'll uh, be specifically asking, we we're actually supposed to have an institute this summer at uh, University of Central Florida in the first week of August, but we're gonna do that process digitally. Uh, and then once we've gone through that vetting process, editing and revising, uh, then we're hopeful that within a year's time, we'll have those uh, materials out and available for everyone. I think some of these uh, are being answered by my amazing panelists as we go along. Um, I wanted to plug, someone said uh, that maybe when they get to the Library of Congress sites, sometimes hard to find things. There are other, I, I wanna plug the Library of Congress's uh, Flickr photo stream. It's amazing. And um, the, the pictures there, um, the images, the photographs from history are, are phenomenal. I'll put that in the, in the blog post as well. Um, Martin, can I jump in? Yeah, go for it. Um, so I, I responded to that question about the Library of Congress catalog being a little overwhelming. Um, you might want to start with the teachers page if you're not familiar with the Library of Congress. It's loc.gov slash teachers. It's a little smaller. It's designed specifically for educators. Um, it, it isn't going to be as overwhelming as starting with the home page. Um, so if you are looking for resources, that's a really great place to start. Yeah, and I want to add to my very favorite feature uh, with Library of Congress is Ask a Librarian. Uh, and they are very responsive. And so when you have a question of a source that you're looking for, uh, they're very quick to respond and help you find a source or help you find sources around a topic that you're seeking. Having, uh, depending on this, one of the questions says, so you want to have, provide students with collections, but you also want them to learn how to navigate the where to next on their own. Do you have tips for helping them figure out how to follow up and find sources on their home, own at home? And I'll, I'll throw that out to the group, but of course that is dependent upon what grade level you are, are teaching. Um, it's, you want to curate the sources clearly for younger students. And as they get older, it is an important skill for them to go out and seek those sources themselves. So uh, I'll throw that out to the group. What, what is that for maybe middle school or high school? Um, how, do we, how do we help students venture out on their own to find sources? Well, one way is to start with um, a collection or an exhibit at the Library of Congress that has already been curated. It's on a topic, it's on a theme, and ask students to stay within the parameters of that. Uh, the other thing I would suggest is the um, primary source sets off of the teacher's page that uh, Jen mentioned. And uh, going back to an earlier question, those primary source sets have wonderful PDFs that are simple to call up and, and print and um, mail out or hand out to students. Okay, and, and I had an offer from Jack to, to do some research on the applicability of these on phones. And I think that's really important, especially, and he points this out, especially in the uh, urban school settings where technology mm -hmm. equals a student phone 
We don't, we shouldn't assume that if someone is coming online, it's on a desktop. Um, so that would be great if you wanted to do some of that research. I know that when we design um, uh, Inquire Ed, I should say, we, we've, we each week we release uh, an inquiry, a week-long inquiry um, that I'll put in the blog post as well that um, is for K through eight students. And uh, we're, we try to be very careful about designing it both for desktop and for mobile because so many people are accessing that. So Martin, if I might speak to the question about finding sources, and I thought Anne's recommendations were outstanding because many of the, rec the where to next uh, are through some of the already culled collections that the Library of Congress has uh, and the teacher and student resources that are available. But I would also emphasize being cognizant of how much time it takes to find sources. So I think you have to, I mean, we, we talk about this pedagogically in the work that we're doing as educators is how much time do we want students focused on content and how much time do we want them searching for content. Each has a different uh, purpose and a, a different educational value and you have to weigh the difference between the two. So I often encourage that you begin first with your earlier learners with navigating primary sources that you offer smaller collections that you provide them like packets and you can easily do that uh, primary source sets and then that you move into more individual navigations of topics that they have particular interest in because that's ultimately and over progressions over time where we want to get them can I also jump in yeah yeah please. Um, as a librarian I'd also put in a plug for contacting your school librarian because um, even though we're teaching remotely your school librarians are still out there and available to help mm. students search for resources and teach them search skills. Um, that's probably going to be one of your best assets. Um, I could do a whole hour long webinar on search strategies, um, but we don't have time. So um, talk to your school librarians and see how they can help. You just offered that, Jen, I have to say. <laughs> so I'm going to be I'm going to be contacting you because it's so important. <laughs> that's really great. And um, I, someone asked if we um, were going to do more webinars like this. We are going to, through NCSS, we're talking with Tina and some other people at NCSS, and we want to do a weekly webinar that is dealing with distance, social studies distance learning, and focus it specifically one week on elementary, and then one week on middle school, and then high school. So uh, stay tuned for that, and, and we'll let you know when, when those are on the books. But they should be one a week, maybe starting next week. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll send an email out to everyone to let them know. If you have more, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Martin. I just got to put a plug out. The Library of Congress and a lot of the individual, the regional um, TPS partners have just been doing an amazing job. There are online office hours, there are webinars. So I really encourage you to, um, you know, take a look at the individual organization pages too. There are a lot of, well, a lot of us are trying our best to be nimble and um, quickly offer some of these virtual ideas and resources. And I tell you what, if uh, Sarah and Jen and Anne and Tina, if you know one of the sections of the blog post, I'll have a webinar section. So if you know of any webinars that are coming up that you think people would be interested in, if you want to share those with me, then I'll create that. Um, I'll curate a little list for them. Okay, great. great. So I want Thank to make a plug. For, yeah. Can I make one plug for one yes. last thing in the Library of you Congress? Can. They have blogs and the blogs are very short. Uh, like an example of one yesterday was uh, put out on the cartography of contagion. Uh, and so those are great where it's a collection of three sources and it's three maps of the spread of disease in the United States. Um, and so you might want to look at the blogs too as good places to begin. Great. Okay. Great. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Anne and Tina and Jen and Sarah. And, um, and then thank you all for, for spending time today uh, learning. And uh, we're all on an inquiry now. And uh, it's a, an exciting time. It's a challenging time. But we are learning and we are inquiring. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, panelists. Yay to you. Um, and I will be in touch with everyone uh, tomorrow uh, via an email and a blog post. But have um, a good uh, Wednesday and be well, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all participants. Thank you. Take care.